Okay, sir. Therefore, okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, here with you this evening to discuss the topic of pre-gestational diabetes. Um, and this is a very important topic because this uh, many patients with diabetes plan pregnancy and undergo pregnancy. And therefore, it is important to understand how best to manage these patients. So for the purpose of this presentation, uh, I will only talk about diabetes that is diagnosed before pregnancy. So pre-gestational diabetes is diabetes that is, as far as this presentation is concerned, diagnosed before pregnancy. And I will discuss the pre-pregnancy planning of the management of, of uh, this diabetic patient with a focus on glucose control. Now, hyperglycemia, or high blood glucose, which is detected at any time during pregnancy, can be classified either as gestational diabetes or pre-existing overt diabetes because you find out a high blood glucose in pregnancy. Now, that could either be a pre-existing diabetes or gestational diabetes, but that is not something I'm going to discuss in this webinar. In this webinar, I will discuss a type 1 or a type 2 diabetes a lady who is already diagnosed and is now planning pregnancy. So as I said before, pre-gestational diabetes and gestational diabetes are two different categories and I will talk about pre-pregnancy plan. I'd like to just show you this slide which looks at the prevalence of uh, diabetes in pregnancy and also discusses what proportion of people who have diabetes in pregnancy actually have gestational diabetes and how many of them have pre-gestational diabetes. So for all the diabetes in pregnancy, about 13% of them have pre-gestational diabetes. And if you look at uh, all patients with pregnancy, about 1% would be the prevalence of pre-gestational diabetes. The prevalence of gestational diabetes in India has been about 9%. But as I said before, I would only be talking about pre-gestational diabetes, which actually occurs for only about 1% of all pregnancies. Now, in this slide, which I'm putting up, I'm just showing you the agenda for my presentations today which is uh, to discuss pre-gestational diabetes under five headings. The first heading is why we should treat hyperglycemia. The second heading would be what are the targets? Is treatment going to be effective? How should glucose be monitored? And finally, what are the treatment options? Let's look at the first uh, topic of the agenda, which is why should we treat hyperglycemia? Now, it is very important to achieve normal glycemia in pregnancy because in early pregnancy the risk of miscarriage the risk of malformations are all highest when the blood sugar or the average glucose is more than 180 and the hb1c of more than eight percent increases the risk of miscarriage and birth defects so it's very important that uh, uh, you know treating hyperglycemia and achieving normal glycemia is important and the reason why we are worried about treating hyperglycemia is because of the risk of malformations, the risk of miscarriage, and the risk of macrosomy. So there are three M's, if you like, malformation, miscarriage, and macrosomy. And there are also some other issues which can occur uh, in uh, pre-gestational diabetes when they become pregnant, and that is a preeclampsia, perinatal mortality, uh, protein urea, and of course, uh, uh, preterm delivery. So four P's, if you like, preterm delivery, perinatal mortality, preeclampsia, and proteinuria, of course, which is part of uh, the preeclampsia, eclampsia syndrome. So therefore, it is very important to treat uh, hyperglycemia and achieve normal glycemia in pregnancy. There are, of course, other complications that can occur uh, in pregestational diabetes when they become diabetic. And one of one important one is a uh, diabetic ketoacidosis because the prevalence of placental hormones and other hormones increasing in pregnancy would heighten the risk of diabetic ketoacidosis. And some complications of diabetes can actually worsen. For example, retinopathy can worsen, proteinuria and hypertension pre-existing can worsen. It's been well shown that uh, patients who have diabetes and microalbuminuria or even macroalbuminuria prior to pregnancy, there is a risk of a preeclampsia which actually goes up. I just want to focus a little bit on macrosomy because macrosomy is something important and macrosomia uh, uh, increases the risk of shoulder dystocia in pregnancy. 
In general, we define macrosomia as a weight of more than four kilograms uh, after the 37 weeks of pregnancy. But I'm an endocrinologist and gynecologists and obstetricians will be able to discuss this further. I will soon discuss in a set of slides as to how macrosomia occurs, but I just want to say that about 15 to 45 percent of diabetic pregnancies actually have macrosomia, and one out of four macrosomic babies actually have shoulder dystocia and, of course, a need for cesarean section. So, I've looked at why we should treat hyperglycemia. Now, I come to the second part of my uh, for the agenda for this lecture, which is if we decide to treat hyperglycemia and if we decide to achieve normoglycemia, what should be our targets? And again, I'd like to put up this slide uh, for, for you to look at, which looks at uh, the targets of uh, glycemic control in pregnancy. There is some controversy out here, so I will discuss the controversy as well. The fasting glucose, I have set the target as 70 to 95. I, I, I'm using the word I've set the target because that's what the ACOG says, but if you look at the American Diabetes Association criteria, the targets for fasting glucose in pre-gestational diabetes is 60 to 90. I personally feel that 60 to 90 is very aggressive, so therefore I have looked at 70 to 95, or rather 70 to 92 milligrams per deciliter, if you like. And that's a fasting pre-breakfast value. The pre-meal value I have kept it at below 100, and this is, you know, at the references are given below. The one-hour post-meal should be below 140. The two-hour post-meal should be below 120 milligrams per deciliter. The HbA1c. The HbA1c, which is a three monthly index of glucose control, I have, uh, uh, you know, I'm, is, uh, I, I'm suggesting that we keep it below 6%, but there are some caveats. The Endocrine Society recommends keeping it below 7%, and even uh, if possible, below 6.5%. So that 6% is not a holy uh, grail or set in stone, and uh, somewhere below 7% would be quite acceptable. But if you look at very ideal situation, yes, below 6% is a very ideal situation. If you look at the late night time readings, that is hypoglycemia, which you need to avoid. So at about 2 to 3 a.m., you need to avoid hypoglycemia and keep the blood glucose levels more than 60 milligrams per deciliter. And at any stage, the mean glucose levels should be 110 milligrams per deciliter. And as I said, this lecture will focus on prenatal glucose control in type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And, and, and the guidelines are given below the references. And again, I show the slide which shows the effect of HPA1C during pregnancy. And you can see that in the first trimester, the HPA1C starts coming down. In the second trimester, it's down there. And the third trimester, the HPA1C increases. Now, that's because in the first trimester itself, pregnancy is a state of uh, heightened body activity. And the bone marrow also produces a lot of new, fresh, young, little RBCs. And remember, the HPA1C is a mean is is a mean uh, is a is a is a marker or a de it is determined by the mean RBC age. And when you have a lot of random red, red blood cells being produced, the mean red blood cell age actually comes down, and therefore the HPA1C actually starts coming down in the second trimester because of the fluid expansion that occurs in pregnancy. The HPA1C keeps coming down, but by the time uh, one reaches the third trimester. Because the RBC age has increased, the HPA1C starts coming up. So how do you interpret the HPA1C in pregnancy? A rough rule of the thumb is that the HPA1C is lower by about 0.4% or other percentage points in a later pregnancy. And that HPA1C is a good indicator, not really of fasting uh, blood sugar because that can go down, but a, a good indicator of the post-meal hyperglycemia. And as I had said, the Endocrine Society in the US recommends a goal of below 7%. Ideally, people believe it should be kept below 6.5% uh, well before pregnancy and during pregnancy. So I've looked at why we should treat hyperglycemia because of the three M's or the four P's. I've looked at targets which suggest that one needs to keep the fasting uh, uh, somewhere between 70 to 92 and the one hour and the, post and the two hour values, uh, post meal values below 140 and 120, and the HPA1C as close to 6% as possible, but at least below 7%, uh, uh, and if possible, as close to 6% as possible. On that note, I'd like to look at my next uh, uh, aspect of my lecture, which is to actually uh, 
uh, tell you that is the treatment effective? And in order to discuss whether treatment is effective, I'd just like to put up this data slide, which looks at whether treatment is effective. And I hope you can now see this slide, which is a very interesting study published in Diabetes Care 2011. And it looks at the odds ratio, just for just one outcome actually, preeclampsia, for each 1% decrement in HPMLC uh, before pregnancy. And you can see that in the first antenatal visit and in the 34 weeks gestation, the adjusted odds ratio was 0.76 and 0.58. And that was statistically significant, as you can see by the p-value, which was less than 0.05. Now, how do you interpret this light? Very simply, an odds ratio below one indicates protection and above one indicates risk. And an odds ratio that is below one and statistically significant indicates significant protection. And this slide very simply shows you that keeping the HPV1C lower by about one percentage point will actually reduce uh, the risk of preeclampsia by approximately 30%. So that it really shows a profound effect. And again, I'm showing you the next slide and this is a very, very busy slide showing you that euglycemia can improve outcomes. But this is one really important slide. In the very left hand panel of the slide, you can see the HPA1C. And the HPA1C from top to bottom actually decreases. Or rather, if you look at the HPA1C from the bottom to top, it actually increases. And what is evident is that when the HPA1C increases from 6.9 to 10, the prevalence of congenital malformations, the relative risk, rather not the prevalence, the relative risk versus the background population has almost more than doubled. From 1.4, it has gone up to 3.9. Similarly, the risk of perinatal mortality, when you look at an HPA1C of less than 6.9 to an HPA1C of more than 10.4, the perinatal mortality has also more than doubled from 2.8. Uh, the risk, relative risk of perinatal mortality has gone up to 7.3. And the risk of any serious adverse event, uh, if you look at the relative risk, has again more than doubled from 1.6 when an HPA1C is below 6.9 to uh, 4.7 when an HPA1C is above 10.4. And this is data from 933 women with type 1 diabetes. And this shows you very exquisitely the effect of increasing HPA1C levels on a worsening outcome with respect to congenital malformations, perinatal mortality, and any serious adverse outcome. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, major congenital abnormalities may occur in as high as 6 to 12% of diabetic pregnancies. Now, when the HPA1C is about 10%, there is a very, very high fetal anomaly rate of almost 20%. But when you can bring the HPA1C to below 6%, when you can bring it to below 6% or close to 6.5 or below percent, 6.5 percent or so, the fetal malformation rate comes down to as close to normal pregnancy, so about two to three percent. That shows you this slide, which uh, is based on this data, which is based on the ACOG Committee on Practice Bulletins published in the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology in 2005 actually shows you the importance of glucose control and HbA1c reduction on perinatal uh, and fetal complications. So we've looked at why we should treat hyperglycemia. We've looked at what are the targets. I've shown you very, very convincing data, extremely convincing data that uh, control of blood glucose is effective. Now we go on to the fourth point, which is how are we going to monitor the blood glucose levels? And that, uh, again, I'd like, you, like to show you this interesting slide, which looks at uh, a continuous glucose profile of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, a patient with type 1 diabetes and pregnant. So that type 1 pregnancy should actually read as type 1 diabetes and pregnancy. You can see on the slide a nice green band. And that green band shows you approximately the normal glucose levels as far as the machine is concerned. And the black arrows actually show you at what are the times it is recommended to check blood glucose levels using a capillary glucose meter. So the times are 3 a.m. and you need to keep the blood sugar above 60 at 3 a.m. Then the fasting 
one hour post meal you could also do a two hour post meal but a one hour post meal is quite good and then of course prior to any exercise or any hypoglycemic symptom and when i say fasting and post meal it could be pre meal and post meal for all the three meals of the day and of course at bedtime so this is just a rough slide it shows you a continuous glucose monitor but it also shows you the time in the monitor reading at which time one should check uh, with a glucose meter so any patient with type 1 or type 2 diabetes planning pregnancy these are the times at which the patient should pull out a glucose meter and check the capillary glucose readings and this is as per the american diabetes association recommendations now i'd like to show you this slide which looks at the deterioration of retinopathy in pregnancy and this is a problem with not just intensification of treatment which is also a problem with pregnancy we know that in diabetes there is microvascular damage which means that the small blood vessels to the kidney to the eyes and through the nerves of the feet are affected we know that this affectation leads to retinopathy neuropathy nephropathy so but in early stages these micro damaged little vessels are still patent but when the effect of pregnancy comes into play pregnancy is as you know a slightly hypercoagulable state because of the hormones the narrowed but patent vessels can get blocked and this slide shows you in the blue skyscraper, patients without retinopathy, 10% can progress to some form of retinopathy. In the grace or black skyscraper, patients with mild retinopathy, 21% can actually progress to a more severe form of retinopathy. And patients with severe NPDR, uh, about 55% can progress. Therefore, progression of retinopathy is an important problem. So we come to the end of that slide. And now I'd like to show you that, tell you that the American Diabetes Association recommends that you need to check the retina before pregnancy, during the first trimester, during the second trimester, third trimester, one year postpartum, or as per the ophthalmologist's discretion. But the, some guidelines of the American Di the position statement says that you need to check it every six months in pregnancy. So that's fine. I think the important thing is you need to check for retinopathy in pregnancy. There are a few things which a uh, woman with pre-existing diabetes when she plans pregnancy should, should make a rough checklist. And I'm just going to tell you about what is a preconception checklist for patients with pre-existing diabetes. I think the first and the most important is to achieve an A1C goal of 7%, or if you can achieve a lower HP A1C goal without hypoglycemia, you know, 6.5 or as close to 6%. Because remember, when diabetes happens, you know, you have high blood sugars, but when a diabetic patient becomes pregnant, so that HP1C can go up further. So therefore, if you reach an HP1C of 6, even the, the diabetogenic effect of pregnancy may push it up to 6.5, but still you are safe. So the first thing is to achieve a good preconception HP1C of below 7%, at least uh, uh, below 7%, but ideally below 6.5 or close to 6%. Second is to assess and manage any diabetes related complications before pregnancy, which means looking for neuropathy, nephropathy, retinopathy, uh, coronary disease, thyroid dysfunction also should be checked in women planning pregnancy. The third thing is, of course, I'm going to discuss in the slides to come, which is a treatment, which is to switch to insulin. The fourth thing is to give folic acid five milligrams per day, three, milli three months before conception to about 12 weeks post conception. And of course, then to discontinue potential embryopathic medicines i'd like to say that diabetes itself causes embryopathy and that's probably because of the effect of hypo hyperglycemia on microvascular disease and the microvascular disease and other uh, milieu affected by hyperglycemia can cause diabetic embryopathy but and that is manifested by the various malformations the cardioskeletal renal spinal manifestations etc but at the same time, the, the, the malformations are, but at the same time, you need to discontinue certain embryopathic drugs, which a diabetic patients may be taking. So you need to discontinue ACE inhibitors, you need to discontinue ARBs. So how would you treat hypertension that pre-exists? You may have to give methyl dopa, you may have to give long-acting calcium channel blockers, you may have to give even beta blockers. And statins should be discontinued. So the five points in the checklist, attain an HP1C below, uh, which is appropriate below 7 or close to 6.5% to assess and manage any complications. 3. Switch to insulin. 4. Give folic acid. And 5. Discontinue uh, embryopathic medicine. These are the 5 checklist points uh, which broadly summarize uh, patients who are planning pregnancy. And finally, I come to the treatment. So we've looked at 
why we should treat hyperglycemia, and I've discussed all the reasons why we should treat. We've looked at the targets. We've looked at whether the treatment is effective. We've looked at how often to monitor. Now we briefly look at the treatment options for uh, pre-gestational diabetes. I'd like to put up this slide, which uh, is, a, is an animation which shows you actually how uh, glucose and insulin play out in a diabetic pregnancy. Remember, insulin really can't cross from the mother to the, to the fetus, but glucose crosses from the mother to the fetus. Therefore, if insulin production is not enough or when insulin action is not enough, the mother's blood glucose levels go up. So this slide says mother's blood sugar levels, but I really mean the mother's blood glucose levels goes up. And when the mother's blood glucose level goes up, too much glucose will cross from the maternal side uh, to the fetal side. And when too much glucose crosses to the maternal to the fetal side, the fetal insulin production goes up. And because the fetus insulin production goes up, the fetus becomes macrosomy or a large uh, size baby. So that's how gestational or pre-gestational or uncontrolled hyperglycemia or high glucose in the mother can actually cause macrosomia in the fetus because insulin can't cause glucose can cross and the glucose crossing into the fetus causes fetal hyperinsulinemia. Insulin is a growth factor and causes macrosome. Now let's look at the other situation. We all know that insulin can't cross but the glucose crosses the placenta. But what if you give too much insulin to the mother? Well, if you give too much insulin to the mother, the maternal glucose comes down. And when the maternal glucose comes down, less glucose is available to cross from the mother to the baby. So less glucose available to cross from the mother to the baby means two things. One is that glucose itself as a nutrient is less available. Second is that low glucose means less insulin and less growth factors. Therefore, the baby can become small for gestational age. So this slide shows you that the prevalence of macrosomy or a large for gestational age baby goes up when the mean blood glucose goes up in the mother. And when the mean blood glucose goes down, the prevalence of small for gestational age uh, 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 goes up again. So therefore, high blood sugar, high prevalence of large for gestational age or macrosomy, low blood glucose, small for gestational age baby. And, Therefore, you need to have a maintain a glucose reading of about 100, 110 mean average glucose reading for optimal benefit. Now, I'd like to go back and stop sharing the slide and discuss some dietary aspects with you. Now, the caloric requirements are increased by at least 300 calories, kilocalories per day in singleton pregnancies. In twin pregnancy, you have higher calorie requirements, higher weight gain targets. Of course, very rapid and excess weight gain means a large for gestation age baby. And the role of weight loss is actually controversial. If you look at the proportion of diet, I think 50 India is a country where we eat a lot of carbohydrates. So carbohydrates should still have about 50% of the diet. Protein, about 20% of calories could come from protein and fat, about 30%. Again, uh, uh, you know, saturated fats should be very, very low intake. And of course, trans fats to be avoided altogether. If you look at the calorie distribution, 15% of the calories should come from breakfast, 25% with lunch, 30% with dinner, and the other 30% as snacks. So 15% with breakfast plus 25% with lunch is about 40%, plus again 30% with dinner is about 70%. And again, so 70% plus 30 is 100, the final 30 being uh, the snacks. There is one clinical practical tip which one may need to remember is that nocturnal hypoglycemia is very common, especially in the first trimester. So a bedtime snack is a good addition to add on to prevent nocturnal and early morning hypoglycemia. But if you look at some guidelines, they allow non-caloric artificial sweeteners in pregnancy, but I would say that if it's possible to avoid artificial sweeteners completely in pregnancy. And so that's about diet. And about exercise, 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise in most days, if not contraindicated by the obstetrician. So I leave the decision to the obstetrician, but 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise not involving the abdominal muscles, if involving the walking or something like that would be good. So pre-gestational type 2 diabetes is associated with obesity. And recommended weight gain during pregnancy could be you know, 7 to 10 kgs for overweight 
women and about four to eight kgs in obese women. Obese women should actually uh, put on less weight as overweight women. And the best choice for treatment, when we come to the treatment, when we look at medication, the best choice of treatment in pre-gestational diabetes, which is type one or type two diabetes, is insulin and intensive insulin. Oral agents may have a role in gestational diabetes, but little role in pre-gestational diabetes, but some role in some selected settings because you can use uh, metformin in polycystic ovarian disease patients who go on to become diabetic and type 2 diabetes coexisting. But largely, insulin is the best choice for treatment. And what is the insulin that should be given? I think multiple dose of short-acting insulin three times a day and a long-acting insulin. That's called basal bolus therapy. Because in the normal human body, you have insulin throughout the day, which is basal insulin. With each meal, you can give a bolus, which is called a bolus insulin. Now, if you look at the good choices for basal insulin in a pre-pregnancy diabetes setting, is tetimere insulin or NPH insulin. These are good choices for basal insulins. And of course, the prandial insulins, you can use regular insulins, but to minimize postprandial hyperglycemia, Aspart, which is a rapid acting analog, and Lyspro, which is a rapid acting analog, are good. Now remember, NPH, Detimere, Aspart, Lyspro. All these insulins in pregnancy are category B, which means that animal studies have failed to demonstrate a risk, but there are no adequate and well controlled studies in pregnant women. And glargine, and blue lysine probably, glargine is actually category C, which means that animal studies have shown adverse effect. And there are no well-controlled studies in humans, but sometimes potential benefits, when they exceed the risks, you might warrant the use of the drug. For example, somebody on glargine who has now become pregnant, you would like, you may like to continue it, but wherever possible, before pregnancy, switch the patient to a basal bolus insulin. The basal could be either NPH given twice daily or detimere, and the bolus with each meal could be a regular insulin or preferably an aspart insulin, which is a rapid acting analog or a lyspro insulin. I'd like to just put up this slide because it is a complicated slide and this slide shows you, you know, the insulin uh, uh, requirements in pregnancy. And I'd just like to clarify that this is not for gestational diabetes or diabetes detected in pregnancy because that's not the focus of my talk. This is only for pre-gestational diabetes. And I've divided into pregnancy into three trimester. You can see three boxes there, uh, less than 13 weeks, 13 to 28 weeks and more than 28 weeks. And this is again for type one diabetes who become pregnant. And you can see that it's very easy to remember the first trimester, second trimester and third trimester, the insulin requirements are 0.7 units per kilogram per day, 0.8 units per kilogram per day, second trimester, 0.9 units per kilogram per day, third trimester. So 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9. Now this is for type one diabetes. Remember type two diabetes patients have insulin resistance. They may have obesity, they may require larger doses of insulin. So they may require up to one to 1.6 units per kg per day as very early on. So for example, if you have an 80 kilogram lady, she might require 80 units a day and half 40 units could be given as basal, which means NPH uh, 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 20 units uh, morning and evening and half as approximately as bolus, which means the other 40 given three times a day. And very, very obese patients may require up to 1.5 to 2 units per kilogram per day. That slide should read as 1.5 to 2 units per kilogram per day, not 1.5 to 2, but 1.5 to 2 units per kilogram per day. And therefore, average in pregnancy, the dose in type 1 diabetes could increase by about 52 units. In type 2 diabetes, the requirement may be very high. Again, I'd like to show you this slide. This is a pictorial slide which represents that in the normal body, you have insulin throughout the day and one insulin with each meal. And insulin pump therapy is nothing but an advanced form of basal bolus therapy where a pump delivers insulin and the pump delivers insulin to just under the skin throughout the day. And therefore, I just like to show you this slide again. I'd like to just share this slide, which is a slide of insulin pump in a patient a patient uh, who is type 1 diabetes and is also on a continuous glucose monitor. This is taken just two months ago. You can see it's in April uh, uh, 2016, just taken two months ago. She is a type 1 diabetes patient 
on insulin pump who has become pregnant. So really, insulin pump is a very, very expensive treatment in India, and you don't need to actually put every diabetic pregnancy on insulin pump. It's a very, very rare, complicated, expensive form of therapy. But if a type 1 diabetes is already on an insulin pump and becomes pregnant, you would like to continue the insulin pump therapy. Insulin pump is an excellent form of controlling diabetes, but it's very, very expensive. So we can't recommend it to a resource poor country like ours. But in this slide, you can show, you can see that there are several lines of different colors. And you can also see the green band. So any dot above the green band suggests a high glucose level. Any dot below the green band suggests a low glucose level. And you can see that repeated chances of hypoglycemia that occur during pregnancy. And you can see on each day of the week, for example, I think if uh, I'm the Friday, the, it's a red color, and you can see yellow color is for Monday. So each day you have a different blood sugar reading. Largely, the blood sugar of this patient is doing reasonably well because it is a very difficult to control type 1 diabetes patient. And as you can see in this slide, this shows you insulin pump and a continuous glucose monitor, the Dexcom glucose monitor in pregnancy. You can see the average glucose level of this patient is extremely good, 104. And you can see in the panel, the hours from zero hours to 23 hours. So all the 24 hours of the day, the blood glucose levels of quite a good average glucose about 104. So very difficult to maintain this and keep it. But this patient managed to maintain it on insulin pump therapy. And uh, this was done when she was pregnant. So insulin pump therapy, a good form of uh, uh, giving insulin uh, to a type 1 diabetes patient who has become pregnant, but obviously very costly in India. So what is the role for oral drugs? I think insulin is ideal. Metformin can be used as an adjunct or an alternative to insulin. Now, metformin can be used when insulin doses go up, or in very mild cases, you can actually use metformin, but usually you will require insulin in almost all cases of uh, pre-gestation and diabetes. Metformin is especially useful in patients with polycystic ovarian disease who become pregnant. Now, I'd just like to give a small disclaimer here because I have told that basal bolus insulin is the ideal form of insulin therapy in pre-gestational diabetes. In gestational diabetes, which I'm not covering actually, you may require only primary insulin. But where you require very, very small doses of insulin, there may be a role for pre insulin as well. The so large majority of patients with pre-existing type 2 diabetes will require basal bolus insulin. A small minority may be managed from pre insulin. But I can tell you that almost all pre-gestational type 1 diabetes patients, almost all of them will require, not almost all will require type 1 diabetes becoming pregnancy, will require a basal bolus insulin or even sometimes occasionally pump therapy. While there is some data to support glibenclamide, because it is among the sulfonylurea oral drugs, it is got the least transfer across the placenta. Remember the studies for this of glibenclamide was done in gestational diabetes and that means that diabetes was diagnosed well after the first trimester and the second trimester. And therefore there is very little data on glibenclamide in the first trimester. And first trimester is a state where uh, fetal logarithmogenesis occurs. And therefore, I would not use any other oral pill other than metformin uh, in pregnancy. I would not use glibenclamide, though there is some data to support. I would not use acarbose. I would certainly not use thiazole in dions or any other form of therapy for diabetes, pre-gestational diabetes. In the first trimester, there can be a decrease in the total daily dose of insulin, a risk, increase in risk of hypoglycemia, which may not be good. It can cause intrauterine growth restriction, as I showed you in an animation. Uh, and therefore, you need to be careful. In the second trimester, you have insulin resistance coming in because of the placental hormones, the fetal hormones, the uh, estrogen, progesterone, and other hormones. So you might see that insulin requirements actually double or triple. So you may have to aggressively increase the dose in pre-gestational diabetes weekly or bi-weekly. As pregnancy progresses, you might have to decrease the basal and increase the prandial component. Remember, first trimester and especially mid-trimester hyperglycemia. Mid-trimester hyperglycemia is a very important predictor of fetal macrosomia and can be corrected by intensive glucose control. Now, what happens during pregnancy, during labor, uh, that is intrapartum management? Intrapartum glucose control is important uh, because neonatal hypoglycemia can occur. Insulin resistance rapidly goes off with the delivery of the placenta. Sudden decline in insulin requirement occurs. 
So you can give some IV short-acting insulin. You can give intravenously as an infusion for intrapartum control of glycemia. But you will see that the insulin requirement rapidly comes down, even in type 1 diabetes, even in patients who require pump. Once the delivery occurs, the insulin requirement comes down. So you might like to keep the blood glucose levels during labor somewhere between, say, 100 to 180 milligrams uh, uh, per deciliter. So uh, therefore, it's also important to remember that a baby of a diabetic mother may have complications like uh, a neonatal hypoglycemia, erythrocytosis, uh, 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 acute respiratory distress syndrome, hyperbilirubinemia. So these all need to be managed by a pediatric intensive care uh, specialist intensivist. Postpartum management is again that insulin requirements decrease after delivery. In fact, in a type 1 diabetes, the insulin requirement is approximately 50% of that during pregnancy after delivery. You know, if patient is on 80 units per day, it might come down to 40 units per day. In type 2 also, the dose comes down. In a type 2 diabetic, though I don't really use it, you can use glibenclamide and metformin. Metformin, of course, I have used uh, in patients during lactation. And you can use uh, metformin safely during the lactation period. And of course, uh, breastfeeding should be encouraged. I would not have to say that to su such an enlightened audience. But in the pre-gestational diabetes as well, you need to encourage breastfeeding. So ladies and gentlemen, I've come to the last second last slide of my talk. And I have discussed the five points, why we should treat hyperglycemia, uh, because of the four P's and the three M's, what are the targets? I've looked at uh, a fasting, which is below 92, post meal one hour below 140, the HPA1C as close to as close to below 6.5%, uh, uh, ideally uh, as close to 6%, below 6.5% if possible without hypoglycemia, at least below 7%. Is treatment effective? Yes, it is. It has been shown to reduce preeclampsia, malformations. How should glucose be monitored? Uh, it should be monitored using the glucose meter. I've discussed the timings of the day. What are the treatment options? Insulin, of course, in different uh, uh, methods, the ideal treatment option. I, I just would like to put up my last slide, which is to thank you for listening to me. And I'd just like to put up that slide, which also shows uh, uh, my Twitter address. So in case you have any questions, uh, which we may not be able to discuss for paucity of time, like you to contact me on Twitter if you wish to discuss. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to me. It's a pleasure. So you can now pull down the slide and then we can see. Uh, so I think one of the important questions is that what is diabetic embryopathy and does it have a link to uh, oxidative stress? I think that's a very important question because if you look at diabetic embryopathy, people believe it's a microvascular disease, but it may not be uh, actually a microvascular disease. But there are other factors such as oxidative stress and the hyperglycemic milieu of pregnancy, uh, ketone body production, all these may come into play. But yes, oxidative stress is probably an important contributor to diabetic embryopathy and people have debated the role of certain kinases enzymes and some effect of hyperglycemia on genes as well and epigenetics but we are not sure but yes oxidative stress seems to contribute to diabetic embryopathy then there is a question here in early stages of diabetes physicians have prescribed glimepiride uh, pyridazone and metformin and the early fasting reading is 138 and 216 what is your opinion, is, uh, I'm asked. Well, I think insulin should be given well before pregnancy. Any diabetic patient who's actually uh, planning pregnancy, I tell them three months before you stop all oral drugs, put yourself on insulin, get that HP1C to about 6% if possible, and then plan pregnancy. Take some folic acid, work yourself up for complications. Don't get worked up, but work yourself up for complications. And I think clomipiride, uh, I would not use it in pregnancy. Pyoglitazone, certainly not because pyoglitazone, pyoglitazone may actually cross the placenta. People are not sure whether it does, but it can decrease insulin levels. And it, there are some animal studies which have shown, if I remember right, in triutrine growth restriction. And therefore, uh, I think uh, that uh, question, I, I completely agree with you, Dr. Poonachandra Rao, who's asked that question that, you know, we would probably use insulin in those settings. Uh, the question by Dr. Abhichandani was relating to oxidative stress and embryopathy, which I discussed. And he's also discussed in what are the key components of preconception diabetes management. So HbA1c and the control 
pre-evaluation for diabetic complications such as neuropathy, nephropathy, retinopathy, coronary disease, and thyroid, uh, folic acid, and of course, avoiding diabetic embryo toxic drugs such as ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and statins to be stopped and then shifting to other drugs. There is a question by uh, Dr. Rao, uh, Dr. Narayan Rao, how often do these patients go on to develop over diabetes later in life? Now, I'm discussing pre-gestational diabetes here, which means that the patient is already having diabetes before pregnancy and is planning pregnancies. All of them will probably be on, uh, so have diabetes continued even after delivery. But your question, I suppose, is gestational diabetes or diabetes diagnosed during pregnancy, which is in the gestational diabetes range. I think uh, studies have shown that after about 10 to 20 years after delivery, about 20 to 30 percent of the person will develop type 2 diabetes, and therefore you need to have some diabetes prevention program for them as well. Next question is by uh, uh, Dr. Manjusha. Is this related to increasing maternal age? Yes, maternal age will increase the risk of gestational diabetes. Dr. Vinod Abhishandani asks, can we measure HP1C monthly by acknowledging the second and third trimesters are less reflective of tight glucose control? I completely agree with you that if we know the limitations of HPA1C, the fact that the first trimester, the life, the average age of the RBC comes down, in the second trimester, you may have fluid expansion, in the third trimester, the HPA1C may improve. And if we assume that the HPA1C may be about 0.4, percent different when we understand all the caveats in HPA1C then I think if you use HPA1C to monitor it may be effective and we have used HPA1C a couple of times in patients on the type 1 diabetes going on for insulin pump therapy and we found it to be quite a good marker so um, There is a question here from Dr. Gulati. Uh, what label to be given to females with blood glucose levels of 140 to 199 in the first trimester, GDM or type 2? Well, now again, I'm talking only about pre gestational type uh, diabetes, which is largely type 2 or type 1. But if a patient is not pre diabetic, becomes pregnant in the first trimester, you do a, a GTT. Uh, what I like to do is a 75 gram GTT, and I check at 0, 1, and 2 hours. I look at values of 92. 180 and 153 at zero, one or two hours, and take two values as being abnormal. I think if the fasting is more than 126, then you are dealing with overt type 2 diabetes. Whereas if the fasting is 92 to 125, you are dealing with gestational diabetes. Similarly, if a post glucose is more than 200, you are dealing with overt type 2 diabetes at anywhere 148, 199, it's probably gestational diabetes. Now, these are all semantics because the targets are like, likely the same. Dr. Mahinder Singh asks, uh, what is the target level of blood glucose levels to be maintained in pre-gestational diabetes? What is the target postprandial levels? Is it possible to keep a pre-diabetic level even during pregnancy with diet and exercise and medication? Yes, the target level of fasting blood glucose, if you look at the American diabetes criteria, is about 60 to 90. But in my slide, I have used 70 to 95, which is a different criteria because I acknowledge that it is very difficult to achieve that kind of blood sugars without hypoglycemia. 70 to 92 is what I, sorry, 70 to 92 is what I had recommended. The American Diabetes Association criteria is 60 to 90. And I really leave it to your choice. If you can achieve a good HP1C without hypoglycemia and HP1C of six, excellent. But we all know that it's good to talk about or give talks about, but in practice, very difficult to achieve HPA1C of below 6% in the Indian setting. And that's a limitation we face because Indian patients resource limited. They are not willing to do their glucose meter tests six, seven times a day. Though I have patients who, occasional motivated patients who can do it, but we struggle to motivate them and also the economics of glucose meter testing so many times a day. And the, if you don't do enough tests, and if you just try to achieve targets, you are going to land up in hypoglycemia. So I, I would I would answer that question saying that the target post meal one hour level is about 140, two hours is about 120. And it is you have asked whether we can keep it at three diabetic levels. We can if we have a really motivated patient who's really going to do the glucometer, really test six times a day. But it is difficult. But if you can, fantastic. I think there will be a lot of questions coming, and I'm delighted actually. And how often should blood glucose be monitored in diabetes taking injection as part for gestational diabetes? Well, the recommendations are that you should test seven to nine times per day 
So that is the actual recommendation. That means fasting before each meal, one hour after each meal, at bedtime, 3 a.m. Yes, the occasional motivated patients does all these values. Where cost is a concern, even buying a glucometer strip is a concern for resource limited Indian patients. I tell them at least test three times a day if possible, at least once a day, you know, some monitoring is better. And we'll have to look at our targets practically. What is the ideal HPVC target below pre-gestation diabetes? Well, I think that is that question by Dr. Govindrajan is also a question which uh, uh, is something which I have slightly uh, been ambiguous about because I've talked about three criteria. I've looked at HPVC below seven, 6.5 and six. Which one would I choose? I would choose below 7% because that is what the endocrine society uh, recommends, the uh, US recommends uh, below 7%. But if I could have a motivated patient who's willing to keep it below 6.5% or close to 6%, why not? That's a broad number to remember. 7% is what the endocrine society of the US recommends. Um, I think uh, if there are, yeah, there are more questions coming in. What is the reason for sudden intrauterine death in diabetes? Well, we are not sure why there is sudden intrauterine death in diabetes. People believe it is because of the effects of hyperglycemia and the effects of hyperglycemia on the vasculature. But again, we are not very sure. There are several mechanisms. Any comments on factors I mean, I say, well, it is available. It is expensive, but it is not routinely available. I haven't used it. Thank you for asking that question, Dr. Seema Adwani. Dr. Rajshekar, does the concept of glycosylation endpoints responsible for diabetic food and other diabetic complications valid since the pathophysiology of the disease? I think this is not a question that is related to pregnancy because, in pre but I'd like to still answer that question because it is a felt need for all of us doctors to understand why there are diabetic complications. And therefore, when you have glucose bound to proteins, this binding is earlier reversible and then becomes irreversible and advanced glycation end products are basically you know glucose binding to proteins and glycation occurring and those end products are supposed to cause complications yes they are reflective of complications especially diabetic foot diabetic retinopathy microalbuminuria well are they the only important factors we don't know because HbA1c is a glycated product and it's not a hundred percent reflective of complications. It is. So we've also recently published in, in a journal of clinical proteomics looking at other markers which could uh, also reflect hyperglycemia and also reflect uh, 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 complications. Yes, we require more markers, but for the moment, advanced glycation end products do explain uh, diabetic complications very well and glycation inhibitors offer promise. Again, this question is not related to a uh, 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 diabetic uh, 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 gestational diabetes or pre-gestational diabetes to the question for diabetes in general. There is one more question by Dr. Vinod who asks is how would you define hypoglycemia in pregnancy and how would you define hypoglycemia in the pre-pregnancy state? Now that's a very interesting question. Now, before pregnancy in a non-pregnant person, you define hypoglycemia as a blood glucose level of below 70. But in pregnancy, you define hypoglycemia as a value below 60. Now, why is that? That's because in pregnancy, you have counter-regulatory mechanisms coming in at a lower range. And traditionally, we define hypoglycemia based on counter-regulatory hormones. What are counter-regulatory hormones? Well, if you've not eaten for a long time, of course, I've had my lunch, but if you have not eaten your lunch, and if you are still feeling hungry, at a particular sugar level, you will have a release of hormones like glucagon, adrenaline, cortisol, growth hormone. These are called counter-regulatory hormones. The level at which these counter-regulatory hormones increase, that's usually set as a diagnosis of hypoglycemia. So in a non-pregnant adult, at a blood glucose level of 70 and below, you will have a good counter-regulatory response. But in pregnancy, it's as low as 60. And remember, in the first trimester, the blood glucose naturally falls down in the fasting state. So you are going to get, so therefore, in pregnancy, it's below 60. In, in, in uh, uh, non-pregnant people, it's below 70. And therefore, in pre-pregnancy, it should be below 70. And once patient becomes pregnant, the hypoglycemia should be below 60. Again, I would say achieve a target of 70 to 92. That would be a reasonable target to achieve for, because if you bring the blood sugars during to the closer 
the lower limit of the normal, the chance of hypoglycemia goes up. Those are pragmatic suggestions from my side. I think, uh, thank you. Uh, I've been overwhelmed by questions and questions are still pouring in. And I've really liked talking to you because I have so many questions coming in and uh, that shows your interest. I, I would like to thank you for listening to me. It's a pleasure talking to you and have a great day. Thank you very much.